Good afternoon. Everybody be seated, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to welcome you to the highlight of Inauguration Week 2011, the official installation of the 10th President of Roger Williams University, Dr. Donald J. Farish. My name is Mark Mandel. I'm a member of the University Board of Trustees and Chair of the Board of Directors of the School of Law. As you can tell from the formal procession that just started this ceremony, uh, presidential inaugurations are steeped in centuries of tradition. And in the United States, uh, that tradition dates back to the 1600s, where the nine colonial colleges actually started the tradition of celebrating changes in leadership at the presidential level. Today's investiture is actually a rite of passage so that we can reflect on how far we've come as an institution and on naming a new president, on what we can do to continue to do what we do best and to maximize our potential. So we'll be true to the traditions of inaugurations and we'll hear from the many people the many representatives of the groups who have come to honor Dr. Farish and to celebrate with us, our student body, our faculty, our administration, our board of trustees, the greater Bristol community, which we call home, our governor, and other esteemed individuals. Dr. Farish will also present his inaugural address. And while he will, he'll be introduced to you more fully by Chairman Richard Brady uh, in a little while, let me just tell you that uh, I know Dr. Farish is going to offer some very thoughtful ideas as to how we can best maximize the sentiment of our namesake, Roger Williams, that he expressed centuries ago, which are words to the effect, when you do what you do best, you help not only yourself, but also the world. So before I finish my brief introductory comments, let me just thank the uh, inaugural committee that is co-chaired by our vice chair, Denise Jenkins, and also by uh, Bob West, who's the vice president of advancement, and Lynn Forthrup, who's the vice president of enrollment here at Roger Williams University. Uh, second final brief thought, that if leadership really means bringing people together so that you can accomplish what can't be accomplished individually, and if it really means empowering other people around you, and that that empowerment doesn't mean just letting them say yes to you, but really express what they honestly believe, if it involves an understanding that integrity must exist in every decision-making process and that objectivity is the key to successful decision-making, if leadership really means perso placing personal ethics over personal gain and means being passionate but being wise, or as President Mandela said, subjecting our blood to our brains, if it means having a vision and being willing to share it, if it means having an understanding that anything is possible, and if it means actually having a belief that you can really make a difference, then we are really fortunate to be here to celebrate the investiture of our 10th president, Dr. Donald Farish, who is an extraordinary leader who has all those qualities and many more. So at this time, I'm pleased to present to you the Roger Williams University Chorus, which will perform Randall Thompson's Alleluia in place of a traditional invocation. Uh, the chorus was founded 30 years ago under the direction of Joan Roth from Bristol uh, at the request of then President William Rossini. The RWU chorus is both a club and a class, and it has many students from a multitude of different academic majors. Currently under the direction of Professor Adjunct Faculty Member Jonathan Richter, the chorus performs on campus and in the local community throughout the year. Ladies and gentlemen, the Roger Williams University Chorus.
Thank you, Mr. Richter and chorus members. Before we begin our speaking program, I'd like to welcome two distinguished attendees to today's investiture. With us this afternoon are two former presidents of Roger Williams, Anthony Santoro, who continues his service to Roger Williams as a faculty member at the School of Law, and William Rosini, who led Roger Williams from 1978 to 1989. Thank you both for joining us on this memorable day for Roger Williams University. With us today to offer greetings on behalf of the Roger Williams University Board of Trustees is Denise Jenkins, the board's vice chair. Denise, would you please join me at the podium? I know that many of the faculty, staff, and students gathered here have come to know Denise as she played a very key role in our presidential search efforts, chairing the committee that led us to Dr. Farish. Denise's dedication to Roger Williams University has been and remains ceaseless. Her passion for education is evident in a distinguished career that has included leadership roles at the New Pride School, at School One in Providence, and now at the Rhode Island Foundation. I can tell you from personal observation that Denise's passion is genuine and it's honest. Uh, you would be hard pressed to find somebody more sincere as a person than Denise Jenkins. Denise. Thank you for those kind words, Mark. I'm very honored to be standing here today to bring all of those assembled here greetings on behalf of the Board of Trustees of this great university that I am certain is now going to become a greater university because of Donald Farish. This past year, it was my distinct honor to serve as co-chair of the Presidential Search Committee. One thing from the beginning, and I know some faculty members will remember this, we promised that we would make every attempt to assure that the campus community would be involved in an inclusive search, one in which all constituencies would have a voice. I really want to praise all those who served on the committee itself, all those who wrote me emails, and there were a lot of them. If I didn't get back to you yet, I'm still working on them. And all who attended the campus forums and those who participated in any other manner. We're here today to celebrate our unanimous decision. I also praise my fellow board members, and particularly Chairman Brady, for their leadership in the time of transition and for so quickly bringing about a new leader to Roger Williams University. Today, we all look forward together. I believe that many of you have probably already experienced Dr. Farish's collegial and participatory, strong and fair leadership style. As a board, we welcome his leadership and the vision that he will apply to bring to this fine university to the next level. The university's strengths will be identified and celebrated. New and competitive programs will be discussed, securing our future. I am certain that under Dr. Farish's leadership, our campus will become more diversified in all ways. And I have no doubt that he will lead us through our future ambitious and sure to be successful fundraising efforts as well. That will support and bring us to final financial security on this campus. I've been really kind of lucky because I have had the opportunity to spend time with Don and his wonderful wife, Meyer, in the recent months. I have to give a little shout out to Meyer. She's part of the community, too. They are wonderful people who re will represent and have represent this university well. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I officially welcome them as I officially all welcome all of you attending today. Finally, I have to say, after the last year, which has been a rather busy one at Roger Williams, I personally cannot wait until we formally swear in our new president. And I know we've got the right man. Thank you, Denise. 
I'm honored to be able to introduce to you now the 74th Governor of the State of Rhode Island, Lincoln D. Chafee. Governor Chafee, would you please join me at the podium? Many of you know Governor Chafee as one of Rhode Island's esteemed public servants, having served as Mayor of Warwick, as a United States Senator for eight years, and now as the first independent elected governor in the state of Rhode Island since John Collins in 1786. Now, you may know that Governor Chafee graduated Brown University in 1975 and that since in from 2006 to 2009, he's back at his alma mater, or was back at his alma mater, teaching as a distinguished visiting scholar on foreign policy. What you may not know was another institution he attended, the Montana State University Horseshoeing School, and that for seven years after he went to that school, he served as a farrier at harness racetracks across the United States and Canada, and that actually he was very successful. One of his horses set a track record. One of the horses he shot set a track record. His great-great-grandfather was governor of Rhode Island. His great-great-uncle was governor of Rhode Island. His father was a United States senator. His great-great-uncle was a United States senator. Governor Chafee is carrying on as ably as anyone could in his family's great tradition of public service. From my personal contacts and awareness of Governor Chafee, he's a person of great humility and of personal integrity. Governor Chafee. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, very much. And on behalf of the state of Rhode Island, I'd like to welcome Dr. Farish and congratulate him on his new position leading this fine university from wintry Winnipeg to beautiful Bristol. Welcome. One of the many unique things about Rhode Island is that even in this small state, we have such tremendous quality of higher education. Roger Williams University, Salve Regina University, Bryant University, University of Rhode Island, New England Tech, Community College of Rhode Island, Brown University, Rhode Island School of Design, Rhode Island College, Johnson & Wales University, Providence College, and the Naval War College. There is no question that Roger Williams is a rising star in this galaxy of institutions that continue to make our state an even better place to live. You have here a gorgeous campus. You have noted programs in such diverse fields as architecture, criminal justice, and marine biology. You have excellent graduate and professional schools, including the only law school in Rhode Island. You have a committed, experienced faculty and staff a talented and diverse student body, and with Dr. Farish at the helm, I am confident that Roger Williams will continue to make a name for itself not only in Rhode Island, but across the country. I'd also like to acknowledge Interim President Ronald Champagne for his leadership over the past year and commend Chairman Rick Brady and the Board of Trustees on the national search that has resulted in Dr. Farish's appointment. Rhode Island is proud of Roger Williams, and I look forward to working with Dr. Farish to continue the positive relationship between the university and the state. Congratulations and thank you. In addition to the distinguished representatives, we have in attendance today, both of our United States Congressmen, uh, Jim Langevin and David Cicilline, sent proclamations in honor of today's occasion. While Congressman Langevin and Cicilline could not join us in person, they do have representatives here, and we want to thank you for coming, and please extend our gratitude to the Congressman. Later this afternoon, after Dr. Farish's inaugural address, we will hold a reception next nearby, right next door in the gymnasium. These proclamations and other awards that have arrived will be there for you to view. Professor Mel Topf, would you please join me at the podium? Professor Toff is one of the longest serving faculty members here at Roger Williams University, having taught writing and rhetoric since 1969, 42 years. At a university where the student experience is at the heart of all that is done, Professor Toff stands out. Known among his students for his rigor 
in his challenging assignments. He's also described as someone who cares deeply about his students' learning and their success. More than a few students have described Professor Topf as a great teacher and the best teacher they've ever had. Professor Topf is here to represent our faculty. He serves outside of the classroom as the president of the Faculty Senate. He has helped to cultivate Jewish life on campus as an advisor to Hillel. He's also an alumnus, having earned his Juris Doctor degree from the School of Law in 2005. Thank you, Professor Topf, for your service to Roger Williams University and for representing your colleagues at today's ceremony. Thank you, Mr. Mendel. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to represent the faculty at this inauguration of President Farish. I've been at Roger Williams University, as Mr. Mendel noted, too long, while President Farish has been with us only a short while. The question most often asked of me, besides when are you going to retire, is, so what do you think of the new president? It is, as teachers say, a good question. The early years of the university were not happy ones regarding relations between the faculty and their president. I, for example, introduced a no-confidence motion in an early president that was neither Santoro uh, nor Mazzini's, um, <laughs> which passed uh, unanimously and the president discharged uh, not long after. I later became the president of a faculty union that had been created largely in response to concerns about the university's leadership. So I may not have been the best choice to represent the faculty today, but I was that choice, so I must be honest. I've had the opportunity to work unusually closely with such a new president, and on the basis of that, and on the basis of my experience working with presidents over these uh, 42 years, I believe that we now have a president of extraordinarily high distinction and integrity. He has evidenced an early commitment to engage faculty in university affairs, and it has been my personal pleasure to work with him during the last several months, even on several very difficult issues. That we have a president of this caliber is to the credit of our Board of Trustees, and it reflects, I think, a growing respect of the Board for the faculty's central and crucial role in a university. I call on the Board to continue to grow in this respect for, uh, for the faculty who have dedicated their professional lives to answering two ancient and noble callings by becoming teachers and scholars. And so I take great pleasure on behalf of the faculty in welcoming President Farish and to wish him every honor and every success during his time at Roger Williams. Thank you. <clears throat> Nicholas Samortis, class of 2012, will you please join me at the podium? Here today to offer greetings to Dr. Farish on behalf of the student body is the President of the Student Senate, Nicholas Samortis. To say that Nicholas is a well-rounded student would be an understatement. A senior legal studies and philosophy double major, Nicholas is communication director for the College Republicans, treasurer of the Public Relations Student Society of America. He's been president of the mock trial team is a member of the Multicultural Student Association and other involvements. Nick is a classic example of what it means to make the most of an RWU education. Nicholas, thank you for being here today. And thank you very much. It is quite the honor to be here today. John Quincy Adams once said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Today, more than ever, we see how important this quote is to any institution. With all the problems that our government is facing today, we see the significance of having a great leader that people can stand beside rather than behind. Someone who has the ability to not only work for their institution, but work side by side with its members. Someone who we feel comfortable with representing our great university. After my first meeting with Dr. Farish, I knew that he was the right person to be our leader, to be our president. The reason I know this is because as, I, as high as I already set my expectations, in his short time as president, 
he has already begun to exceed them. Whether it's having lunch with each and every full-time faculty member, or working hand-in-hand -hand with the administration in attending Bristol Town Councils, or showing enthusiasm for student life by attending our pep rallies, sporting events, and even saving us from a hurricane. A great university president is one who cares about all aspects of the Roger Williams community, whether it is administration, faculty, or the student body. Since Dr. Farish has arrived at our university, I have heard only great things spoken about him, and I am confident this is a pattern we will continue to see. The only disappointing part for me is that I only have one more year here at Roger Williams. I can only imagine some of the great strides RWU is going to make while Dr. Farish is our president. And no matter where I am next year, I will always be eager to hear what great accomplishments our community has achieved. Whenever I am asked about my favorite part of Roger Williams, I always say how impressed I am with the school's dedication to improving our university and bringing RWU to the top. The school's constant progress on not only improving our name, but ourselves as individuals. The future always looks bright here at Roger Williams University and I am eager to witness the next chapter in our great timeline. And it is now my great honor in welcoming Dr. Farish to our university as our 10th president. I know you're gonna do great things. Here today to represent the Roger Williams administration is Lorraine Lally, the Assistant Dean of Students at the School of Law. Lorraine, would you please join me? Lorraine graduated from Roger Williams University Law School in 2001. After four years in private practice, she returned home to join us and become our Assistant Dean of Student Affairs, focusing on diversity, outreach, and academic support. Since her return, Lorraine has distinguished herself as an administrator who has an abiding focus on meeting the needs of the students that she serves. Lorraine has energized our programs to improve the Roger Williams University law experience for students of color. And at the same time, she has worked closely with colleagues all across the campus who greatly value her perspective and her ideas. Even at an institution where commitment to community is a core value, Lorraine sets herself apart each and every day. She, today, she serves as representative of the university's administration. Lorraine. Thank you very much. I am deeply honored and humbled to give greetings on behalf of the members of the Roger Williams University staff and administration, and to be one of those to officially congratulate Dr. Donald Farish as he begins his tenure as the 10th president of Roger Williams. On this occasion, there is excitement and optimism that is palpable. As a staff and administration, we look forward to working with Dr. Farish on his vision for Roger Williams University to ensure the growth prosperity, and the strengthening of our institution. Dr. Farish, as you develop and implement your vision for this university, hundreds of staff members and administrators stand at the ready to support you in your goals. While we look forward to working with you and collaborating with you as you lead Roger Williams University, today we really invite you to challenge us to exceed even your expectations. The staff and administration, we are fully committed and optimistic about your leadership and the future of this institution. The past four months have confirmed for us that your thoughtful and deliberate leadership will serve us well for the challenges and the opportunities that are facing higher education. On today, we greet you, Dr. Farris, with arms extended to both welcome you as the president of the university and really to support you in your work today and in the future. Congratulations on your appointment as the 10th president of the Roger Williams University.
now it's my pleasure <coughs> to welcome to the podium university trustee and alumnus, Tim Newton. Tim is the president and CEO of a company called Black Duck Software, and in 2009, he was named one of the most influential people in the world in the open source software industry. And I wasn't exactly sure what that was, but I appreciate Tim at lunch explaining it uh, all to me. His resume includes such technology giants as Dell, Equalogic, and Compaq. In addition to his duties as a university trustee, Tim also serves as president of the Roger Williams University Alumni Association. Tim, thank you very much for being here today to represent the alumni of Roger Williams University. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Roger Williams Alumni Association and the 22,000 alumni we represent around the world, I would like to add our welcome to Dr. Farish as he officially becomes the 10th president of this university. As both a trustee of the university and president of the Alumni Association, I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Farish as he's come on board uh, this summer and fall, and I've been incredibly impressed with the leadership, the compassion, and the wisdom he's exhibited in his short time here. There's no doubt in my mind that he will be a fantastic leader for this institution and propel us to new heights. From the, uh, the perspective of the Alumni Association, it's clear that his impact will also be extremely positive and immediate. He has already been engaged with the Alumni Association Board. He's uh, hosted a very successful, uh, actually record-setting alumni weekend uh, earlier this year. And in November, he'll be on the road meeting with alumni across New England and New York. Most importantly, he understands that engaged, supportive alumni are essential to the long-term health and success of the university and that this is an area we can and must improve upon over the next few years. In his short time here, Dr. Farish has proactively demonstrated his commitment to reinvigorating the Alumni Association and reaching out to alumni worldwide. I graduated in 1980, and I can tell you that uh, at no time in the past 31 years uh, have I sensed the level of excitement that exists among the alumni and their excitement about engaging with the university once again. Our alumni are very loyal to the university. They're proud of what this institution has become, and they want to get reconnected, though it hasn't always been easy. They understand, more than anyone, that the continued success of the university makes their degree more valuable. Today, with the leadership of the Advancement Office, the newly reconstituted Alumni Association, and most importantly, the personal commitment of Dr. Farish to ensuring the alumni are an integral an essential part of the university community, the future of Roger Williams couldn't be brighter for alumni, past or future. So welcome, Dr. Farish. On behalf of all alumni, we're truly excited to have you here. Before we continue with the speaking program, it's my pleasure to announce that present today is New Jersey State Senator Diane Allen, who is a friend of Dr. and Mrs. Farish, Senator Allen. Um, Senator Allen is in a re-election campaign, but we decided she wouldn't get up since she's from New Jersey. Not only did Senator Allen travel to Rhode Island to join us today, she has personally delivered a congratulatory letter from New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, as well as a resolution from the New Jersey State Senate in honor of today's investiture. Senator Allen, your support and your presence is greatly appreciated. Lisa Churchville, would you please join me at the podium? A longtime leader in broadcast journalism, Lisa came to Rhode Island in 1997 to join NBC 10 WJAR in Providence, serving as president and general manager until her retirement just four months ago. In addition to leading the Providence NBC affiliate to tremendous gains during an era characterized by rapid chain in the change in the broadcast media, Lisa immersed herself in the greater Rhode Island community. She's been an advocate for organizations as diverse as the Providence Public Library, the Rhode Island Philharmonic, 
United Way, Tides Family Services, and others. Over the last decade, she's offered her unique, informed perspective to Roger Williams University as a member of our Board of Overseers, as the university has achieved unprecedented growth in size and stature. Lisa, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Mark. It is a great privilege and pleasure to join with everyone here today to welcome President Farish to Roger Williams University. My congratulations to the board, the faculty, administration, staff, and students who participated in the selection and installation of a new president. It is a momentous occasion for a university and a great cause for celebration. We are especially delighted that so many esteemed guests have gathered here with us to celebrate the, our greatest optimism in the future for Roger Williams University. I bring fond greetings from the Board of Overseers, 31 friends of the university who serve the president in an advisory capacity. We also serve the student body mentoring and counseling students about their lives off campus. We bring the news of the many important things that happen on this campus each day back to our communities, to our colleagues, to our friends, and to our families. Our hope for you, President Farish, is that the abundance of confidence, affection, and goodwill that fills this space today will be with you throughout a very long and successful tenure. Today, we all thank God that we are a part of Roger Williams University. Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce you today, Diane Medeiros, to offer greetings on behalf of our host community, the town of Bristol. Diane, would you please join me? Diane is currently serving her third term as the town administrator for the town of Bristol. She was initially elected to public office in November of 1984 when she became the first female town clerk in Bristol's history. Diane took the time to earn a second bachelor's degree in 1994, graduating magna cum laude with a business administration degree from Roger Williams. Diane has been a key partner for Roger Williams University in recent years as the town and the university have worked hand in hand to build a productive, mutually beneficial relationship. In her own words, the town of Bristol and Roger Williams have grown to complement each other as part of a symbiotic relationship in which the success of one makes the other one stronger. Diane, thank you for representing the town of Bristol today. Thank you. As the ninth town administrator of the town of Bristol, I am honored to bring the greetings of the town to this inauguration of the 10th president of Roger Williams University. On behalf of the nearly 23,000 residents whom I represent, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Donald Farish and Mrs. Farish to our Bristol community. In 1980, as Bristol celebrated her tricentennial, the following passage appeared in a book outlining Bristol's history thus far as it related to then Roger Williams College. And I quote, during the 60s, the college enlarged its educational programs and multiplied its student body tenfold. An elegantly situated 63-acre waterfront campus, symbol of its new commitment to education, was opened in Bristol in 1969. The college and the community of Bristol are mutually beneficial neighbors. It is the continuing goal of Roger Williams College and the people of Bristol to work together in the best interests of the community they both call home." End quote. In 2007, after many obstacles had been overcome, 
and fate had brought some forward-thinking people together. The town of Bristol and Roger Williams University signed an agreement that has been looked upon by other university towns as a model. The best interests of Bristol and Roger Williams communities had been brought together, indeed, and a step of utmost importance to our respective and overlapping communities had been achieved. Today, together, we take one more step in the positive advancement of relations between the town of Bristol and Roger Williams University with the inauguration of Dr. Donald Farish. This new president's dedication to the affirmed values to which the university is committed, particularly the concept of service to the greater community, which he champions, makes him the perfect fit for Roger Williams University and for the town of Bristol as well. I know I speak for the citizens of the town when I say that we are so pleased that Dr. Farish's travels far and wide have led him here to our town. It is our sincere hope that he continues his distinguished career here in our Bristol community for many years to come. Thank you. To deliver greetings on behalf of the Academy of Colleges and Universities, I'm honored to introduce to you an individual who has a long track record of accomplishments in higher education. Dr. Darrell Greer, would you join me, please? For the last 26 years, Dr. Greer has served as the distinguished leader of the New Jersey Association of State Colleges and Universities, an organization that he founded as chief executive in 1985. In that role, he actively advises the state of New Jersey and its higher education institutions on higher education policy. Over the course of his tenure in New Jersey, he has gained recognition as a leading voice nationally promoting college opportunity, affordability, and accountability. When Dr. Greer announced his approaching retirement last June, he was lauded for leaving a positive, profound, and lasting mark on higher education. We are deeply grateful for the opportunity to welcome you here to Roger Williams University. Thank you, Dr. Greer. <clears throat> And may I add, I'm not a candidate for the President of the United States. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Trustees, Mr. President, Maya, Governor, Mr. Attorney General, distinguished faculty, students, guests, and colleagues, I bring warm greetings from the Garden State and especially from the New Jersey Association of State Colleges and Universities. This is a special privilege for me as a friend of Don Farish's since 1998. Working closely with Dr. Farish in his distinguished and transformational leadership of Rowan University, I know firsthand Don's deep dedication to educational opportunity and excellence. And like your state's founder, Don is committed to education, education, freedom, and tolerance and will work with you to extend Roger Williams' tradition to offer learning to bridge the world in the arts, the humanities, education, law, business and engineering. Roger Williams is one of the nation's top liberal learning and professional universities. You have much to be proud of, yet there remains high expectations for more to be accomplished. The search for a president is in fact the search for the future of your university. You have done very well in selecting Don Farish as your 10th president. Don is collegial, unpretentious, compassionate, and a generous Socratic teacher. He's a resourceful, inspirational, and sagacious leader. I know, because Don has told me this. <laughs> He's told me this many times. And it's now on your website, so you can believe it. <laughs> Seriously, I know that Don is excited and committed to Roger Williams' mission to provide students and faculty with a first-rate learning environment. He's committed to attracting a diverse group of talented students who will achieve here to expanding service to the community and to the state through collaboration with others. 
a hallmark of Roger Williams University. Don brings the passion, experience, intelligence, honesty, energy, focus, and special Canadian wit and charm to engage the university and to lead it. So in bringing warm congratulations to Don Farish on behalf of his many New Jersey colleagues, we wish Don and each of you and the university continued great success. Support one another, nurture one, one, one another, engage and challenge the future together, build new traditions together, and most of all, achieve and grow together. We salute the university and congratulate Don Farish upon his installation as the 10th president of Roger Williams University. Those of us who call Rhode Island home have undoubtedly come to know our next guest since his election as our state attorney general last November. Attorney General Kil Martin, will you please join me at the podium? After graduating from Tolman High School in 1984, Peter Kil Martin enrolled in the police academy and served his native city as a member of the Pawtucket Police Department for 24 years starting as a patrol officer, advancing to officer in charge of prosecutions, and retiring as captain. Along the way, he earned a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Roger Williams University and later enrolled in our School of Law, completing his Juris Doctor in 1988. After 20 years as a state representative, Peter was elected Attorney General of Rhode Island this past November where he has quickly established himself as a leader willing to tackle the most challenging issues to better serve the citizens of Rhode Island. Attorney General Kil Martin, we're honored to have you here to offer greetings on behalf of the Rhode Island State Government. Thank you, and let me say, as Attorney General and as an alumnus, a dual alumnus of Roger Williams University, it's an honor for me to have been invited to participate in such a really important landmark for Roger Williams University. And I must say, I found three good omens in the, over the course of the past eight or so months since Dr. Farish, his announcement is being named the next president of the university. And the first good omen was actually meeting him in recognizing the quiet competence, experience, intellect, and vision, the vision for the university that he possessed. And I walked away from that saying, wow, those trustees did a wonderful job. Roger Williams, my school is in great hands. The second good omen just happened a week ago, and that was when I was at City Year, when I met his wife, Maya who was participating in the City of Year event in Providence. And I said, how wonderful is this? We didn't hire Dr. Farish. We hired Team Farish. And that's important. That's important not just for the university, but it's important for the state of Rhode Island. Because that said to me that they recognize, Dr. and Mrs. Farish recognize, that the mission and the goals of the university go beyond, beyond the borders of the campus here in Bristol and indeed throughout the state of Rhode Island and how much better that will make the state of Rhode Island. And that's important. It also said to me that they cared not just about the students but about their families. And that brought me back to my days when I came here, which brings me to my third omen, and that's what I read yesterday in the paper regarding the Providence Journal article. And he was speaking to Peter Kilmartin as the student so many years ago, that no matter your background, the doors of Roger Williams College will be open, that you have an opportunity, that everyone will be welcome and we will try to get you a good quality education and you and your families, as mine were, proud of that. And that's a great legacy, and that's a great legacy for the state of Rhode Island, too, because I can tell you, I have numerous 
countless colleagues in law enforcement that are graduates of this university. And I can unequivocally state that they are better law enforcement officers because of the education they got at this university. The other part is as the graduate of the law school, I can't tell you how many colleagues of mine in government are now in key governmental positions throughout the state of Rhode Island involving the law, and indeed private positions involving the law, having become the fabric of Rhode Island. And that is a tremendous impact to have in such a short period of time for a law school. And it's a wonderful thing. But it's because of the opportunities that Roger Williams has provided to a kid from Pawtucket like me, and under President Farish's vision, will provide going to the future. So, and in reading the journal article yesterday, it just wasn't about building on the past. It was building about the future. Not just the bricks and mortar, not just the capital campaigns, but the people who will graduate. So what better legacy for Roger Williams University for the present to have Dr. Farish to be so committed and to have a vision for the university and whoever succeeds him, hopefully in the far distant future, those presidents are gonna say, wow, we have a great university due to his tenure and I'm gonna look back and we're all gonna look back as Rhode Islanders and say, wow, what a great future Rhode Island has because of the vision of Dr. Farish in what Roger Williams University produced. So Dr. Farish, on behalf of all of my colleagues in state government, I thank you, I congratulate you, and we look forward to a partnership with an exciting future. So everything that's happened so far has been great. But this is actually going to be fun, this part. Uh, this is a celebration after all. So Dr. Farish's wife, Maya, who, as those who know her know, is not only bright and talented, but warm and thoughtful, wanted to have an inaugural surprise for her husband. And at this time, Don, I get to present the surprise to you on Maya's behalf. Among his many passions, Dr. Farish is an opera enthusiast, and today we get to share in that enthusiasm. Please join me in welcoming Rowan University opera singers Bonita Granite and Marion Stieber, Metropolitan opera singer Barbara Deva, and pianist and composer Alexander Timofeyev.
So, so now I get to introduce the only person who could follow that act. Uh, and I'd like to ask Ambassador Andrew Young to join me at the podium. It's a great honor to have Ambassador Young here at Roger Williams University this week to celebrate Dr. Farish's inauguration. He delivered an outstanding lecture last night as the inaugural speaker, speaker for the President's Lecture Series. His description of his childhood, the neighborhood where he grew up, even the stores on the Four Corners, including the neo-Nazi party store, and how he dealt with it, how he made it so that Atlanta was able to obtain the Olympics over Chicago. Everything he said had valuable life lessons. As United States Ambassador to the United Nations, as a U.S. Congressman, and as Mayor of Atlanta, Ambassador Young has set himself apart as an individual dedicated to human rights and as a person who challenges those around him to rethink their own values and ideas. Ambassador Young was a key leader in the civil rights movement, including the Birmingham and Selma civil rights campaigns that resulted in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 being enacted. In 1964, as Dr. Farish said last night, Ambassador Young was appointed as the executive, the chief of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. He was a close friend and confidant of Dr. King and was with Dr. King in Memphis in 1968 when Dr. King was assassinated. During his tenure as United States Ambassador, Ambassador Young helped end white minority rule in Zimbabwe and Namibia and introduced the concept of the human rights campaign to international diplomacy. He revived the city of Atlanta during recession and helped bring the Olympics games to the city in 1994. He continues to serve through his nonprofit, Good Works International, and the Andrew J. Young Foundation. So I was blessed to have the opportunity to spend with a number of other people at a table 30 to 45 minutes before this inauguration ceremony began with Ambassador Young at lunch. And we asked him questions from everything, um, what do we call you? And of course he said, friends call me Andy, and I don't think I've earned that um, someday. We asked him, why do you say you're just learning now, after all these years of great contributions? And his answer was, because I have time to think about it. What his biggest misconception was now that he is thinking about it, and he said, I thought I knew everything. <laughs> Could have gone on forever. We actually formulated an idea to bring our table up here and just continue the conversation. But we all put historic figures on a pedestal, uh, and Andy Young deserves that. Uh, he's just an amazing and real person. Uh, I cherish the opportunity just to have conversed with him. So I asked him what really meant a lot to me I was proud he was an ambassador, but the fact he was a reverend and grew up where he did and has healed so many people meant so much to me. And would he be offended if I introduced him ultimately as Reverend Young? And he said he wouldn't mind, so I give you Reverend Young. Thank you very much. Dr. King used to quote from somewhere, and I don't know where, that greatness is characterized by antitheses strongly marked. You've got to have a tough mind and a tender heart. And I think that describes a man that you've selected as your 10th president. And I think you've selected a man who comes to a state and to a university that brings together all of the conflicting tensions and problems that face the entire world. And you come here with an open source reality that whatever happens here is got to be made available free of charge to all the world. 
And I say that the world needs what you have here. What I have seen and what I have felt, the tradition of freedom and tolerance in the midst of tremendous diversity, going all the way back to Roger Williams and the founding of this great state. The fact that you name your capital city Providence, reminding you that God is in the midst of all of this chaos and confusion, but that out of this chaos and confusion, our Puritan forefathers conceived of the university, first of all, as a place to bring together the best minds, train the young people to take on whatever challenges the future might hold. Out of this spirit, they not only trained people in this state, but they sent students south to train former slaves, to Africa, to India, to Japan, to educate people in foreign lands, and indeed, I contend that most of the troubles of the world come back to the people who made the bodacious and audacious assumption that all men, and they should have said women, were endowed by the Creator, not by their wealth, not by their education, not by their creed or class, but by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, and amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Essentially, that's what the world expects us to do now. We need to lead the world in the pursuit of happiness, because it doesn't give you happiness, it gives you the right to pursue it. But the missing verse in the beautiful song that the ladies sang is my favorite. And I'm almost glad that they left it out because it gives me a chance to conclude with it. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. That's the tradition in which you invest the 10th president of Rhode Island University. God bless you. At this point, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to the chairman of the Roger Williams University Board of Trustees, Richard Brady. Chairman Brady, will you join me at the podium, please? A highly regarded philanthropist and leader in the business community, Rick Brady served as chairman and CEO of Nortec, Inc., a leading manufacturer and distributor of building products for 21 years until his retirement this past summer. In addition to his many professional accomplishments, Rick has been a volunteer leader for a number of nonprofit organizations, including the Providence Performing Arts Center, the YMCA of Greater Providence. He's a trustee emeritus of the Trinity Repertory Company. He's, on the, he's a trustee of the National Conference of Christians and Jews, and there are many others. Rick earned a bachelor's degree in economics from St. Anselm's College. He's a master's degree in accounting from Northeastern University. He holds an honorary doctorate from, of business management from Roger Williams University and has served as our chair at Roger Williams since 2007. What you may not know is that he was also a pretty highly regarded hockey player in high school and college playing the demanding position of goalie. He's energetic, he's tenacious, and a person of great compassion for those less fortunate. Last March, Chairman Brady introduced President Farish to the Roger Williams community in a pretty memorable event at Global Heritage Hall. Today, we invite him to officially present to you the 10th president of Roger Williams University. Mark, thank, thank you for that introduction. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct pleasure of presenting to you today Dr. Donald Farish, who has been duly selected by the Board of Trustees as the 10th President of the University. The official welcome of Dr. Farish today marks the culmination of a transition process that started more than a year ago when our Presidential Search Committee first convened and embarked upon the search for the individual best equipped to lead this university in the decade ahead. The committee brought representation from across the extended Roger Williams University community, from trustees and administrators to faculty, students, and alumni. And in the end, what resulted was a selection of an individual as the ideal choice by every single university constituency, including the law school. Um, and that's kind of a joke, by the way. Um, now that Dr. Farish has begun his tenure at Roger Williams, I look forward with great enthusiasm to in watching him operate with the thoughtful, collaborative approach only an experienced leader can bring. For Don Farish, personally, the RWU presidency serves as a capstone of an, uh, an outstanding career that witnesses, witnessed his leadership not only at Rowan University, but also at the other distinguished schools he has served previously. Dr. Farish brings a wealth of knowledge, an acute sense of how to develop student-first solutions in the context of the challenges facing higher education, as well as a set of values we all share at Roger Williams. As he settled into Bristol this summer, and he settled in all over the state, and began the process of uncovering our unique campus culture at Roger Williams, Dr. Farish has already articulated some of the key objectives he will seek to accomplish in the coming years. I know that today he will share some of those with you. I look forward to playing a part as he works with all of us across the university to fulfill those goals and take our very accomplished university and transform it into an even more remarkable institution. Donald Farish, by the authority invested in me as chairman of the Board of Trustees, I hereby install you as the 10th president of Roger Williams University for the powers and responsibilities pertaining to that office. Congratulations, President Farish. I now invite you to address the assembly. Well, you certainly know how to make a fellow feel welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Trustees, Governor Chafee, distinguished guests, and family and friends, thank you so much. I, I want to start by acknowledging just for a few minutes uh, a number of important groups. I want to thank the, the search committee and the board of trustees for in, in installing me as, uh, as the 10th president and having the, the faith in me to do that job. I want to thank all of the people from Roger Williams University who came today. Uh, it's, uh, this is my new family. It's wonderful to see you in such numbers. Thank you so much for being here. All of my friends from Rowan, uh, it means so much to me that you would take the time to come up uh, just for a couple of hours here uh, to be part of this joyous occasion in my life, and I, I will never forget your generosity and the times that we had together. Uh, I want to thank my colleague presidents who are here. Uh, some of them are people I know, some of them are people that I, I don't know, but we're just being collegial and are attending an inauguration because that's one of the things that presidents do is give support to each other, and it means a lot to me. There are people from far and wide. One of my oldest friends, Drew Calandrell, is here with his wife, Aziza, from California. Uh, Senator Allen and Sam, her husband, made the trip up from New Jersey to do the present in person the proclamations from the state senate and the governor, and, and that means a great deal. I thought Mark Mandel did an outstanding job today. It's very difficult to introduce 12 people. <laughs> None of you saw the small shepherd's crook that he had in one hand that he was using to pull people away from the podium if they went on too long. Uh, 
Governor Chafee, I'm, I'm honored that you would spend time this afternoon here at Roger Williams and at my inauguration. It's a, a tremendous testimony to your commitment to higher education in the state. Uh, Attorney General Peter Kilmartin, um, a double graduate of Roger Williams, terrific to have you here, Peter. Thank you so much. Daryl Greer, my old friend from, uh, from New Jersey, that again, made the trip up just to say a few words. Ambassador Young. Um, he's just a terrific guy, and, and uh, the fact that he stayed over from last night uh, and he's having to dash off to his plane uh, to get uh, out of Boston back to Atlanta tonight uh, is cutting it pretty close, but um, I just thought it was terrific that he, st he stayed to do what he did. All of the other people that brought greetings from Roger Williams um, as, as part of this installation ceremony, uh, my, my good friends, uh, Virginia Rowan Smith and Manning Smith, uh, the daughter and son-in-law of Henry Rowan, who was going to be here today, but he took a fall and, and has uh, had to be hospitalized. But uh, Jenny Smith has been a longest serving member of the Board of Trustees at, at Rowan in its history. And Manning, her husband, uh, serves to this day on the Tech Park Board. And they're just wonderful friends. And they, they, they came in today. Bob and Sue Brooks, all the way from Pittsburgh. Um, good friends again from my days down in, in New Jersey. Uh, Tom McNamara and his wife Barbara from New Hampshire, part of my wine club. But I want to, uh, I want to mention particularly my family, my, my aunt and uncle from, from Warwick, my mother-in-law from Nantucket, my stepson and daughter-in-law from Brooklyn, my sister and brother-in-law from Vancouver, Canada, came all this way, and most especially my wife Maya, who is my, my partner in this enterprise and whose, whose love and support keeps me going every day. So thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it means a lot. But I have a few things I want to say before we, we finish. So I'm supposed to say something significant. And um, uh, the expectations are a lot higher than my preparation. But let me try a few things. I want to talk a little bit about higher education in America and, in particular, the role that I see Roger Williams being able to play. Higher education once enjoyed the highest levels of support and respect from the American public. Not all of you are old enough to remember that, but that was once true. From the earliest days of the colonization of this country, higher education was recognized as being integrally important in the emerging society. Harvard College was founded in 1636. Now that's 16 years after the Mayflower landed, six years after Boston was established. And they're already building a college. The universities of North Carolina and Vermont, which contest to be the first public institution, they both have good arguments to make, but roughly 1790, I'm not going to decide among them, but, but, but 1790, and there are already public universities in this country. In 1862, in the middle of the Civil War, President Lincoln signed the Morrill Act, and the Morrill Act committed 30,000 acres of federal land to each state for every senator and representative in Congress in order to allow that land to be sold and to support then the extension of higher education into non-traditional areas including agriculture and what was then called the mechanical arts or today we would call it engineering. Because the, the thought was this would be a way in which the economic development of the country would be bolstered because of allowing education in these applied fields. After World War II, the GI Bill sent hundreds of thousands of young men to college at virtually no cost. There were many skeptics who said, those sons of blue-collar families could never possibly succeed at college, but of course they did. And as they graduated, the colleges and universities turned to their younger brothers and sisters and began to expand the whole college and university system. Uh, Sputnik, late in the 50s, and the implicit threat posed by the Soviet Union started the space race, and that led to a massive expansion of higher education in this country that continued right on through the 60s. But by the 1990s, everything had changed. Society's view of higher education as a public benefit had somehow morphed into becoming really more of a private benefit. And that change in society that change in thinking took society 
and the politicians off the hook. If it was a private benefit, then clearly the tuition should be paid for by the individual and his or her families. There's no longer the need to continue the level of public subsidy that once existed. And so with the growing demand for law, for uh, prisons and health care, and the growing concern about rising taxes and the demand for reduction in taxes, there has been this massive disinvestment in public higher education, an area that now enrolls about 70% of all students. But here at an independent private institution, we can't be smug about that because there has also been ramifications for us as well. Graph after graph shows this incredible increase in cost over this past 20 years. And, and today, as we, as we stand here today, there are more than 100 colleges and universities in this country that charge in excess of $50,000 a year, which is an astronomical sum for most families. The consequence has been there's this been a rising chorus of voices complaining about the cost of higher education and complaining about the deaf ear that officials in higher education, the leaders in, of institutions, apparently are showing because the march uh, to increase of cost continues. There's no effort visible to the public to reduce the cost of higher education. Now the irony is if the colleges aren't hearing these voices, certainly the politicians are. Witness Governor Rick Perry's call for the $10,000 degree. And the fact that a presidential candidate is suggesting such a thing is possible makes people believe that maybe it is possible. Now, the fact is that there's no state in the country that spends that small amount of money even on K-12 education. That fact doesn't deter the conversation. And of course, K-12 education does not involve 24-7 education the, the way that we're involved in with residence halls uh, and associated staff. In K-12 education, New York spends the most. New York spends over $18,000 per year per student, K-12 education. But that doesn't seem to lessen the enthusiasm for the cheap college degree. Now, now for myself, I would, I'd like a $5,000 Mercedes. I, I think that's at least as worthy a goal as a $10,000 college degree. But, but my concern is that I might guess that perhaps that $5,000 Mercedes might be lacking some of the amenities that one would find in the current more expensive models. An engine, for example, <laughs> wheels would be nice. But I'll be the first to admit that sarcasm is not a satisfactory response to this challenge. But it isn't Rick Perry's challenge that really concerns me. What concerns me is, is that some of our long accredited public colleges and universities have been so drained of resources that some are tempting today to offer a university education for 60%, 60% of what New York spends on K-12 education. Now, these universities and the degrees they offer, sadly, are mere shadows of what's, what they once were. And it seems only a matter of time before we begin to see some of them losing accreditation. That's the world that we're seeing right now. Diplomas aren't like automobiles. An automobile that is not built to appropriate standards, that's assembled on the cheap, where every decision is based on keeping the price low, is not likely to drive very well. A new owner will quickly realize that he has bought a lemon. Not so with a college degree. The inadequacy of a given degree will become apparent only over time, as its owner proves incapable of performing at the expected level of competence. We are in grave danger as a country if we allow the problem of poorly educated college graduates to become rampant. Our long-standing and hard-earned reputation as the country with the finest system of higher education in the world is under severe threat and is a threat of our own making. So what's the answer? How do we create what we might call affordable excellence in our higher education system? Do we all just shut our eyes and cross our fingers and hope for the return of the good old days when the public respected and supported higher education? I submit we've been doing just that. But whenever we peak, we find the situation has only become worse. Some of that worsening has been self-inflicted. Many colleges have cut costs by increasing class sizes, past the point of highly effective pedagogy, or they've replaced retiring 
faculty members who are tenured with adjuncts. We have allowed bottom line thinking to dictate how we offer our educational programs, and we have too often made the expedient decision rather than the decision that makes us proud. That's the national picture. What can we do about it here in a small university in the smallest state in the Union? This university, as you know, was named for Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, and a man who deserves to be much better appreciated by our nation. We tend to start our pantheon of heroes with people alive at the time of the Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution and the writing of the Constitution. But Roger Williams lived a century and a half before that time, yet his ideas were at the heart of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and in some ways were more progressive than either. At a time when religious tolerance was an oxymoron, there was no religious tolerance. But instead, state imposed religion almost everywhere. Roger Williams founded Rhode Island on the basis of separation of church and state, and he welcomed believers of all faiths, a kind of y'all come, except in the 17th century, I guess it would have been y'all come. But in any case, for that belief, he was reviled by the people in Connecticut and Massachusetts who conspired to have Rhode Island's charter revoked. Their efforts necessitated a trip back to England by Roger Williams, who when he wasn't fighting to have his uh, charter preserved, spent his spare time teaching Dutch to John Milton. Milton, in return, provided uh, some refresher courses in Hebrew. This is what people did before the age of television, apparently. <laughs> they taught each other foreign languages. How quaint. We've, we've progressed so far and since those days. Roger Williams also opposed slavery and endeavored to prevent its inception in Rhode Island. Had he been successful, the history of Rhode Island would have taken a very different turn. And there might never have been a Brown University, but hey, that's another story. The point is, he was a man ahead of his time, but also a man unshakable in his resolve and his beliefs. And one of his beliefs is printed on your programs today. The greatest crime in the world is not developing your potential. When you do what you do best, you are helping not just yourself, but the world. It's as relevant today as it, when he said it, more than three centuries ago. And as a university in charting our course, we could do worse than by asking, what would Roger do? So in recognizing that an inauguration ceremony is an opportunity for a university to imagine its future, let me try and channel Roger Williams by asking, what would Roger do? I'm pretty sure Roger would be appalled when he learned today that we have in America created a society where the top 20% of the population has 85% of the nation's wealth. Indeed, where 1% of the population has 27% of the nation's wealth. Where the middle class is being financially marginalized to the detriment of our economy and where the percentage of people living in poverty is growing every day. The bottom 40%, this is a frightening statistic, the bottom 40% of our country collectively controls two-tenths of 1% of the nation's wealth. Higher education is supposed to be the doorway of opportunity. It's supposed to be the socioeconomic ladder that permits young people to assume the rightful place in society. Why hasn't 60 years of widely available higher education, ever since World War II, why hasn't 60 years led to a more economically balanced society? Well, it's because education itself is similarly misdistributed. If you're born in the top quartile of family income, 82% of you will earn a college degree. If you're born in the bottom quartile of family income, 8% will earn a college degree. 10 times more for the top quartile than the bottom quartile. In what way is this a meritocracy at work? Isn't this why young people are occupying Wall Street and demonstrating in other cities around the country? We're hearing unfamiliar words now like oligarchy government by a few, or plutocracy, government by the rich. 
didn't most of our ancestors leave the old world to get away from a plutocracy? And isn't it more than a little ironic that we're recreating one here in America? I'm pretty sure that Roger would be even more appalled to learn that there's a clear parallel to the concentration of personal wealth reflected in higher education, where a relative handful of campuses enroll, enrolling a tiny fraction of the number, total number of college students sit with multi-billion dollar endowments, while the overwhelming majority of campuses responsible for educating the overwhelming majority of students find themselves too often on the horns of a dilemma. Whether to increase tuition to preserve the quality of their educational offerings and in so doing run the risk of pricing their prospective students out of the market, or maintaining very modest tuition increases knowing that by so doing they face the need of finding ways of economizing that will lead to a poor educational product. Some specific detail. Of more than 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States as of June 2010, 62, 62 out of 4,000 had endowments in excess of $1 billion. 14 had endowments in excess of $5 billion. Now the figures for 2011 are just now coming in because the fiscal year ends on June 30. And Harvard, and I'm, I'm a Harvard guy, I, I'm, I, I don't want to bite the, fan, uh, the, the hand that fed me, but Harvard, by far the richest university, with an endowment last year of more than $28 billion, raised almost $600 million in new gifts last year. Now, put that another way, Harvard raised more money in a single year than the entire endowment of all but 104 other universities. But that's not all. Harvard also reported a return on its investments, that is, on its endowment, of more than 21%, which translates to $5.9 billion. So, put that another way, Harvard had a return on its investments that in a single year was greater than the entire endowment of all but eight other universities. Got to ask Harvard, when their investments are earning almost ten times as much as they're raising new money, why are they still raising new money? But Harvard isn't alone. The quest for more money is ubiquitous. The University of Southern California, which last year ranked 23rd uh, by U.S. News in prestige and also 23rd in size of its endowment, has just announced a campaign to raise $6 billion. Presumably a successful campaign would move the school from 23 into somewhere in the top 20. But I have to ask, is this ceaseless competition for prestige by a handful of extremely wealthy colleges and universities in any way in the national interest? My last institution, Rowan University in New Jersey, was utterly transformed by a $100 million gift from Henry Rowan, a local industrialist. It's difficult to overstate the impact that that gift had on what had started as a local teacher's college. Ranking, size, breadth of programming, overall quality, all rose significantly, outcomes directly affecting more than 11,000 students every year. Now, if you imagine for a moment that the money going into USC's $6 billion campaign, if they were divided into $100 million chunks, 60 universities like Rowan could be transformed, impacting more than 600,000 students. Well, it's never going to happen, but it's nice to dream. So. Let me bring these issues to the local level here in Rhode Island. What would Roger Williams the man do? And what should Roger Williams the university do? I believe that Roger Williams the university should do several things, all of which would lead to its becoming the best university in America. Well, I, I sense a certain disbelief that I uttered those words. The man has taken leave of his senses. How can we become better than Harvard, or Princeton, or, or Amherst, or Williams, for that matter? Well, quite simply, by changing the definition of what it means to be best. Best, today, as defined by US News, refers to a campus that admits a tiny fraction of its applicant pool, 
virtually all of whom are valedictorians or have perfect SAT scores or are both valedictorians and have perfect SAT scores and then spends lavishly on these highly motivated and brilliant students, all the while ensuring that the size of the class stays small enough to be truly exclusive and elite. Now, if we tried to convert Roger Williams to a Harvard wannabe, not only would we be unsuccessful, but Roger Williams, the man, would rise from his grave and demand that we stop using his name at this institution. So, so here are some things that I think we should use when we talk about BEST. BEST is an institution that considers more than just SAT and high school B GPA, but one that seeks students of ambil ability and ambition with the potential to do great things, but who have not necessarily had the opportunity or motivation to show what they can do. We have many of those people in our alumni. An institution attentive to value-added education, where we focus on outcomes much more than inputs where we assess and document the skills and competencies of our students at graduation. An institution that's broadly reflective of the economic, racial, and ethnic diversity of our society, such that all of our students have the opportunity while in college to live in the type of diverse world they surely will be living in once they graduate. An institution committed to the proposition that all young people deserve the opportunity to climb the socioeconomic ladder regardless of the circumstances of their birth. An institution that recognizes the need to create not just college graduates, but graduates who are committed to improving our democratic society, and therefore an institution that prepares students for their future by ensuring that a good portion of their education takes place in the community, where they not only practice what they're learning, but also are doing good for the organizations or businesses with which they are affiliated. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do today in Bristol and in the surrounding communities. And I want to thank the people of Bristol for letting us do that work, and I want to thank them for being here today. An institution that bridges the world by being committed to internationalism, both through study abroad and also through connections that bring international students here. An institution that prepares students for a future that is beyond our current imagination by ensuring that all of them have a strong foundation in the liberal arts and are able to reason at a high level of abstraction, integrate diverse bits of information into a cohesive whole, communicate effectively orally in writing, and are capable of solving complex problems, and finally, an institution that is committed to graduating students with the skills, values, and ambition to compete with the graduates of any institution in this country. That's what I mean by the best university. But there's more. Roger Williams should not just be about residential education for 18 to 22 year olds. We know that a part of the reason why unemployment is so high is that there is a disconnect between what those seeking work can actually do and what those with organizations with jobs actually need. A recent study measured the size of the gap between education and training of the workforce regarding the skills uh, that they had and the skills needed by employers. This study was done for 100 urban areas and they were ranked top to bottom, narrow gap, big gap. Boston is number two, very narrow gap between skills of the workers and the need of the employers. Providence, 40 miles away, is ranked 41. Here we sit, sandwiched between two of the wealthiest states in the country. We have double-digit unemployment in Rhode Island, the second highest poverty rate in New England. I submit that all Rhode Island institutions, both public and private, since all of us are part of the same social fabric, need to address this compelling issue. And at Roger Williams, we should more enthusiastically embrace addressing the needs of adult learners, both face-to-face -face and online. And we must have multiple approaches because this is a diverse audience. Some are college graduates, and they need additional skills to advance in their jobs. Some aspire to advanced degrees. Some have some courses toward a baccalaureate, but they can't seem to find a way to find the time to finish that degree because of other obligations. 
Corporations are looking for educational institutions to partner in programs for their own employees. The military is concerned about finding ways to convert what their soldiers, sailors, and airmen have learned into college credit. These are things that we are doing now and can do more of. So how do I define the best university? It's the one whose efforts add the greatest value to the lives of its graduates. And if at the end we're only the second or third best university in the country, I won't see that as a failure. If our efforts are successful in addressing the full complement of higher educational needs in our country, and that success motivates other universities to follow our lead, and in so doing gets America back to work and into a more positive frame of mind, then we can be proud of the work we have done. All of the things that I've been talking about today, all of them, Roger Williams is doing to some degree today. We simply need to develop an institution-wide commitment to have these things become universal on our campus. And incidentally, the work that we will be doing in continuing studies generates revenue that we can use to help subsidize the inherently expensive program of residential education we offer to traditional age students. So what I'm proposing isn't a pipe dream. It's achievable. We lack only a collective aspirational vision and the collective commitment to see that vision realized. If Roger Williams, the man, could found a new state by walking from Salem, Massachusetts in January to the site of what is now Providence, Rhode Island, then how can we who bear his name be any less committed? Thank you very much. That concludes our program for today. We want to thank you very much for joining uh, in this celebration. As I mentioned, next door in the gymnasium, we're having a reception uh, to warmly welcome Dr. and Maya Farish to, our, to the community and to celebrate further uh, the investiture. Thank you very much. <laughs>